If you have a copy of God's Word, I invite you to turn in it to Daniel chapter 8. Over the next few weeks, we're going to, Lord willing, uh, wind down our time here in the book of Daniel. Here in, here in a bit, we'll, we'll pray and ask for the Lord's help, and then, and then we'll read, really, the entire passage. Um, I think that's the best way to handle Daniel 8 this morning. But before we, we pray, let's, this is going to matter for our time in Daniel 8 this morning. But just, if, you know, if you're a guest with us, uh, or if you're, if you're a member here and just need a refresher, uh, we here at, at Standing Springs, we believe that expository preaching is the, is the, should be the main diet of preaching in the life of a church. And what we mean by expository preaching, just very simply, is that the point of the passage becomes the point of the message. Everybody with me? So what it says here, I am called to say to you. And Paul calls uh, ministers of the gospel in 2 Corinthians 5, ambassadors, ambassadors of Jesus Christ. And so... You think about it, uh, and th- that, uh, that term ambassador is kind of a political term, right? So the ambassador, the U.S. ambassador to, to Sweden or to Egypt or to Cameroon uh, is called to, to share with that nation, wherever they are at, what the, what the president of the United States is saying, what the system of the government at the current time is saying, right? Right? And so the, the, the U.S. ambassador to Sweden goes over there and says, this is what the United States is saying to you. I'm just sharing what the president told me to share. That ambassador, right, that U.S. ambassador in Sweden is going to be out of a job very quickly if he says, I know what the president says, but let me share my thoughts. Let me tell you what I think, okay? President, call him up and say, hey, bud, it's time to come home. It's time to come home. You're fired. You're fired. Paul says, as I've said in 2 Corinthians 5 and really all over the New Testament, that messengers of the gospel, preachers of the gospel, of the word of God, are nothing but ambassadors. We share what the Lord has said in his word and no more. That's what we share. This is where the power lies. This is where the gospel is. And it is so sad that in so many churches today, congregations and, and pastors alike think that, no, what, what, what we need for people, for, for the gospel to finally click in people's minds is for the guy to get up and stand and say it in just the right way, to be clever enough, basically to be a stand-up comedian, get people laughing, and then hit them with the truth. Brothers, sisters, and friends among us, I fancy myself to be somewhat humorous, but not enough to be a stand-up comedian. A stand-up comedian, I am not. And I am not here on my own authority. If I was here on my own authority, I would have been gone long ago. I'm here on the authority of the Word of God. And so three questions that you ask when you come to a passage, just simple Bible study questions, are what does it say, what does it mean, and why does it matter? What does it say, what does it mean, and why on earth does it matter to us? And that's important for a passage like Daniel 8, because if you've read ahead, you're like, what's going on? Like, what's going on? And then you you should be asking, what on earth does this have to do with me? This seems like a really long time ago, and it all happened already. What's going on here? But we're going to try to answer those three questions today. What does it say? What does it mean? And why does it matter to you and to, I, to me? So let us pray and ask for the Lord's help, and then we're going to read all of Daniel chapter 8, and then we'll get going. Father, we ask now that you would help us. You would help me, Father, to preach your word. We could get into discussions about, well, this is that interpretation, and this is another interpretation, but your word means something, and it only means one thing. And so, Lord, we ask that you would speak to us today, Father, that we would understand your word, that we would apply it to our lives. God, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Daniel chapter 8, verse 1, we'll read the entire chapter. 
In the third year of King Belshazzar's reign, a vision appeared to me, Daniel, after the one that had appeared to me earlier. I saw the vision, and as I watched, I was in the fortress city of Susa, in the province of Elam. I saw in the vision that I was beside the Ulai Canal. I looked up, and there was a ram standing beside the canal. He had two horns. The two horns were long, but one was longer than the other, and the longer one came up last. I saw the ram charging to the west, the north, and the south. No animal could stand against him, and there was no rescue from his power. He did whatever he wanted and became great. As I was observing, a male goat appeared, coming from the west across the surface of the entire earth without touching the ground. The goat had a conspicuous horn between its eyes. He came toward the two-horned ram I had seen standing beside the canal and rushed at him with savage fury. I saw him approaching the ram, and infuriated with him, he struck the ram, breaking his two horns, and the ram was not strong enough to stand against him. The goat threw him to the ground and trampled him, and there was no one to rescue the ram from his power. Then the male goat acted even more arrogantly, but when he became powerful, the large horn was broken. Four conspicuous horns came up in its place, pointing toward the four winds of heaven. Verse 9, from one of them... A little horn emerged and grew extensively toward the south and the east and toward the beautiful land, that is Israel. It grew as high as the heavenly army, made some of the army and some of the stars fall to the earth and trampled them. It acted arrogantly even against the prince of the heavenly army. It revoked his regular sacrifice and overthrew the place of his sanctuary. In the rebellion, the army was given up together with the regular sacrifice. The horn threw truth to the ground and was successful in what it did. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to the speaker, How long will the events of this vision last? The regular sacrifice, the rebellion that makes desolate, and the giving over of the sanctuary and of the army to be trampled. He said to him, For 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary will be restored. Verse 15, while I, Daniel, was watching the vision and trying to understand it, there stood before me someone who appeared to be a man. I heard a human voice calling from the middle of the Uli. Gabriel explained the vision to this man. So he approached where I was standing. When he came near, I was terrified and fell face down. Son of man, he said to me, understand that the vision refers to the time of the end. While he was speaking to me, I fell into a deep sleep with my face to the ground. Then he touched me, made me stand up, and said, I am here to tell you, what will happen at the conclusion of the time of wrath because it refers to the appointed time of the end. The two-horned ram that you saw represents the kings of Media and Persia. The shaggy goat represents the king of Greece. And the large horn between his eyes represents the first king. The four horns that took the place of the broken horn represent four kingdoms. They will rise from that nation, but without its power. Near the end of their kingdoms, when the rebels have reached the full measure of their sin, a ruthless king, skilled in intrigue, will come to the throne. His power will be great, but it will not be his own. He will cause outrageous destruction and succeed in whatever he does. He will destroy the powerful along with the holy people. He will cause deceit to prosper through his cunning and by his influence, and in his own mind he will exalt himself. He will destroy many in a time of peace. He will even stand against the prince of princes, yet he will be broken, not by human hands. The vision of the evenings and the mornings that has been told is true. Now you are to seal up the vision because it refers to many days in the future. Verse 27, I, Daniel, was overcome and lay sick for days. Then I got up and went about the king's business. I was greatly disturbed by the vision and could not understand it. Wow. Our goal then is to try to make some sense out of Daniel chapter 8. So the first question, as I've said, is what does it say? We've just covered that. We've, we've covered it, albeit in a, in a quick way, just reading through it. What does it say? Now we spend a little bit of time on the question of what does it mean? But first, some recap, if you will. It's been a while since we've been in Daniel Uh, I think we preached Daniel 7 about a month ago. Daniel 7, you remember, the vision that that he received uh, spanned really thousands of years, and it was global in its outreach and in its breadth. 
It covered things from, from really all across human history. But this vision from Daniel 8 is different. It spans only a few hundred years and is much more localized to the region where these things are happening. We know that it is localized to this region because unlike Daniel 7, in Daniel 8, he is using specific names of specific places back then. Like in verse 2, he says, I saw the vision and as I watched, I was in the fortress city of Susa. That place really existed in the province of Elam. Right? I saw in the vision that I was beside the Ulai Canal. These are all local places to the time of when Daniel was walking the earth over in the Middle East. And this would all have made sense to the Israelites when Daniel wrote the book of Daniel. It would have made sense to them. It would be as if he was saying, you know, I was, I was standing, right? I was in the fortress city of Greenville. And I was standing next to the, to the Reedy River. You would say, okay, yeah, I know exactly what he's talking about. Know where it is. So when you, when you introduce a vision like that, I was in the fortress city of Greenville, standing next to the Ritty River, we kind of get an idea that this is going to be local in, it, in its breadth, right? We're talking about some local thing in the upstate of South Carolina. We're not talking about this national thing, or certainly not this international thing. So that's what's going on here. And it would have made sense to them. So this vision of Daniel 8, unlike Daniel 7, that was global, right, through and through, there's going to be some, some global touches here in Daniel 8, but it's mostly talking about a very specific time in the history of God's people. So then what on earth does it, all this mean? Not only for them then, the original readers, thousands of years ago, but for us today. I hope you know, especially if you're a Christian here this morning, that the Old Testament and the New Testament alike still are relevant to us. They speak about God's story and God's history throughout mankind. God's history in dealing with his people, the Israelites, and his people, the church. What does all this mean? Let's answer a few questions as we go. What we're going to do is we're going we're to ask the questions like, what did he see? And then we're going to get our answers from the interpretation of the vision in the second half of the chapter. So we're going to be going back and forth from the first half of the chapter to the second half of the chapter because the chapter gives us most of these interpretations. So number one, what does he see? Well, he sees a ram with two horns. Very in verse three and four, I looked up and there was a ram standing beside the canal. He had two horns. Two horns were long, but one was longer than the other. And the longer one came up last, right? I saw the ram, verse four, charging to the west, the north and the south. No animal could stand against him. And there was no rescue from his power. He did whatever he wanted and became great. We see this ram is conquering anyone and everyone there. Now the question becomes, who is this ram? And if you were paying attention as we read through the chapter earlier, you will notice that in verse 20, it tells us the answer. The two-horned ram that you saw represents the kings of Media and Persia. This is the Medo-Persian Empire, right, that came along after Babylon to, to, to oppress the people of God. Now, isn't it wonderful when, when the Bible just tells you what it was? You're like, what's the, what's the ram? And the Bible's like, well, that's the kings of Media and Persia. Oh, good, great, check that off. Now, in all of this, and we'll probably reference it throughout, but in all of this, you go read the history books, and it says exactly what the, what the Word of God says. What's remarkable, though, is that Daniel is, is seeing in a vision all of this stuff that we now know as history. He's seeing it at, before it's actually happened. And that's important for us. That's the type of God that we serve. So this ram is, is the kings of the Medo-Persian Empire. Well, what next? Now he sees a male goat, verses 5 through 7. As I was observing, a male goat appeared coming from the west across the surface of the entire earth without touching the ground. The goat had a conspicuous horn between his eyes. He came toward the two-horned ram I had seen standing beside the canal and rushed at him with savage fury. I saw him approaching the ram, and infuriated with him, he struck the ram, breaking his two horns, and the ram was not strong enough to stand against him. The goat threw him to the ground and trampled him, and there was no one to rescue the ram from his power." So a male goat that is an absolute destroyer of all things. And Daniel in this vision is seeing just how swift 
and how brutal this king or kingdom is because in verse five, it says he's moving across the surface of the entire earth without even touching the ground. I mean, he is just flying through his domination of the people that he is conquering. So the question becomes, well, who is this? Well, praise the Lord, the Bible tells us in the same exact chapter, verse 21, the shaggy goat represents the king of Greece and the large horn between his eyes represents the first king. Now, those of you who are history buffs know who this is. You science and math people, we will tell you, or the Bible tells us. This is Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great. In the 300s BC, he is absolutely conquering everything around him. And you read the history books and you see that verse five bears out to be true, that it is swift and it is quick, his destruction of the kingdoms that he conquers. This large horn is Alexander the Great. Once again, this is verifiable history. What comes next though? In verse eight, the male goat acted even more arrogantly But when he became powerful, the large horn, that's Alexander the Great, was broken. Four conspicuous horns came up in its place, pointing toward the four winds of heaven. Now you go back and you read your history books and you see that Alexander the Great, his his reign, while it was swift and it was very destructive, it was quick. It didn't last super long. And he died in 323 BC, and he left no heir, which is why four kingdoms arose from the kingdom of Greece. And these are these four conspicuous horns from verse 8 that we read about. Now, Now, Daniel doesn't mention exactly who these kingdoms are, but from history, we understand these are Macedonia, Thrace and Asia Minor, Syria, and Egypt. So from the great powerful Grecians and Alexander the Great, he doesn't leave an heir and now four kingdoms kind of in his place sprout up and and go in in different directions. That's what verse eight is describing. Now, what next? Remember, we're just in this question, the second question of what does all this mean? What does this mean? What happens next is a a little horn emerges. Verses nine through 12. From one of them, one of those four conspicuous horns, a little horn emerged and grew extensively toward the south and the east toward the beautiful land. Now that direction is going to give us a clue as to what kingdom this is representing. A little horn emerges, grows extensively to the south and to the east toward the beautiful land that is Israel. Verse 10, it grew as high as the heavenly army, made some of the army and some of the stars fall to the earth and trampled them. It acted arrogantly, even against the prince of the heavenly army. It revoked his regular sacrifice and overthrew the place of his sanctuary. In the rebellion, the army was given up together with the regular sacrifice. The horn threw truth itself to the ground and was successful in what it did. Now, who on earth is this? That kingdom that... uh, is emerging south and east toward the beautiful land. That is the Syrian, the Seleucid Empire that rises out of Greece during this time. The Syrian Empire. And history tells us of a horrible figure arising from there that is this little horn in Daniel chapter 8, Antiochus Epiphanes. To the Jewish person, this is one of the worst of the worst. In the second century BC, he would try and force the Israelites to completely forsake their God, to completely forsake their culture, to completely forsake even their way of worshiping their God through the regular sacrifice. And he would put in the temple this this type of an abomination of a sacrifice to a pagan God. Right? And so you had all sorts of animals that were unclean to the Jewish person in the Old Testament, things like pigs and, and, and those things, those types of animals. And what Antiochus Epiphanes did was that he tried to so pervert uh, the, 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 the cultic worship, and when we say cultic, we don't say like cults, that just means worship, the cultic saf- sacrifices of the people of Israel. He tries to so pervert them that he basically drags a pig and other unclean animals into the temple to sacrifice them to a pagan god. 
This is like horrible, horrible stuff to the Jewish person, to the Jewish mind. Imagine if in today's day someone, someone comes in here and starts trying to praise, offer praise and worship, not to the God of the Bible, not to the God who this, these buildings have been erected for his glory. No, they try to start worshiping praise and honor to Satan. Imagine how horrible that would be. I mean, how desecrating and how much of an abomination that would be to us. That's exactly what's being described here. It's exactly what Antiochus Epiphanes did back then. Horrible, horrible stuff. And so the question then becomes, now, but before we say, you know, answer the question of how long does this last, we have to understand this is all verifiable history, as I've said multiple times. You can go read about it. You can just go read about it. And the historians, they don't even, they don't even have to be Christians. They understand this stuff happened. But the wonderful thing and the the awe-inspiring thing, the miraculous supernatural thing about it all is that this was written three, four hundred years before these events took place. God is prophesying through his prophet Daniel, giving him a vision of what is to come in the life of his people Israel. And how long does this last? Tells us in verses 13 and 14. Then I heard a holy one speaking and another holy one said to the speaker, how long will the events of this vision last? This Regular sacrifice, the rebellion that makes desolate, and the giving over of the sanctuary and of the army to be trampled. And here's the answer. For 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary will be restored. Now, the question then becomes, and I know most of you don't care about this. Some of you perhaps will. The question then becomes, okay, is this 2,300 days or is this like 1,150 days? Okay, because the sacrifice is often offered in the morning and the evening. And let me just tell you, you know, theologians, scholars, they're split. They're like, it's either 1150 days, which is just over around three years, three and a half years, or it's just over six years, right? 2300 days, right? I think if, you know, if you force me, say, Pastor, you got to give me an answer today. You got to give me an answer today. I'll never be your friend again. Okay. I'd say probably this is, this is 1150 days. But some of you might think that it's, well, 2,300 days, and so it's six years. And we'll get into a little bit more of that in Daniel 9, 10, 11, and 12. Um, But for now, I think it's probably three and a half years. We've seen so many other uh, types of references, and we'll see them in the book of Daniel. Uh, We saw persecution, you know, earlier is going to last for a time, times, and half a time, right? That's a reference to three and a half years. So I think it makes sense that it's 1,150 years. But if you think, or 1,150 days, but if you think it's 2,300 days, that's fine. We can still be friends. Now, verse 25 and 26 is going to describe this ending. Daniel 8. He will cause deceit. Right? This is Antiochus Epiphanes. He will cause deceit to prosper through his cunning and by his influence and in his own mind. He will exalt himself. He will destroy many in a time of peace. He will even stand against the prince of princes. Yet he will be broken, not by human hands. The vision of the evenings and the mornings that has been told is true. Now you are to seal up the vision because it refers to many days in the future. This is uh, Daniel talking about how it's going to be in those days of Antiochus Epiphanes, right? In the 160s, 170s BC. That is the time of the end that it's being referred to in verses 17 and 19 of this passage, right? It refers to the time of the end. And then in verse 19, it says it refers to the appointed time of the end. Within context here, this localized context of of talking about media and Persia and Alexander the Great, the first king of Greece, this is not the time of the end like the end of all things. This is the time of the end of the things that are being described in Daniel chapter 8. That's what's going on here. This this stuff pertains, um, Gabriel is saying, this stuff pertains to from Daniel's point of when he's living three or four hundred years in the future, right? In the 100s BC, a few hundred years before Christ comes on the scene, this stuff is referring to that time when this, when this little horn, Antiochus Epiphany, comes up. That's what the time period is that's being described here. Now the third question is, why does any of this matter for you? First, we've got to answer the question, why does any of this matter to them? You can't forget the original readers. This, this came to them in history. This word from God through his prophet Daniel, this came to them. 
And you remember way back when we started, uh, well, when we started the prophetic kind of part, apocalyptic literature of Daniel chapter 6 a, a number of weeks ago, we said that apocalyptic literature is often, you know, communicated in, in complex imagery, but it is meant to exhort and to comfort the people of God. This was ultimately meant to comfort the people of God then, and it is ultimately meant to comfort you and I here today. So why, do, why does all this matter to the Israelites of Daniel's day, and why does this matter to us? And this is where we'll spend the rest of our time here in application. Application. We're going to have three things to know slash believe. So application is as much about doing as it is about believing. How should I believe in light of what God says? What should I know in light of what God's word is telling me? So three things to know slash believe and then two things to do from our passage. And then we'll be done. Three things to know slash believe. Number one, our God knows and is in charge of the future. Our God knows and is in charge of the future. This was great news for them because they're in exile. They've been completely taken out of their homeland, Israel, and they're being oppressed by the Babylonians and then the Medo-Persians are coming. And then, you know, you've got all sorts of other kingdoms coming Our God knows and is in charge of the future. How do we know that? Well, Daniel received a vision, didn't he? Daniel received a vision. Now, who gave Daniel the vision? Was it Satan? Does Satan want to encourage and comfort the people of God? No. It was God Almighty who gave Daniel the vision. So you see that we we are like in the middle of of the world and in history, and we can look back and learn things from historical books. And to a certain degree, we can look forward through what we understand in the Bible and see what's coming. But we don't know all that's going to happen. We don't have all of that knowledge. But God is the one who is standing outside of time, looking down and saying, this is how it's going to happen. Our God knows and is in charge of the future. This, these events have a definite beginning and a definite end, and they are definitely beginning now and definitely ending at this point by God's determination. It's not you or I who, who determine when things begin or end. It is God who determines that. And all of this said, most importantly, all of this that is written in Daniel 8 Three, four hundred years before it actually happens, it actually happened in the same way, in the exact way that God said it would happen. Now, it's so precise. This is how precise the Bible is in the things that it predicts and prophesies for the future. It drives people crazy because they just, they just, um, they assume their, their starting point is supernatural things like predicting and prophesying the future are not possible. Therefore, they don't happen. Do you see the problem there? Why don't they happen? Well, because I said they're impossible. Well, that's the wrong starting point. If the God of the Bible exists and he is who he says he is, then nothing is impossible for him. That's the starting point. So if you're here this morning, you're questioning Christianity or the Bible, just, I just want you to do this. Just go to God's word and say, okay, if this God is actually real, then can these things happen? And when you understand that, yes, this God is real, then yes, all this stuff can happen. Nothing is beyond possibility for God. He could do anything and everything that he wants to do. But this drives, especially liberal scholars and theologically liberal scholars and theologians crazy because they have hard hearts and they don't have Holy Spirit empowered imaginations. Are you with me? And they just say, well, this couldn't have been written three, 400 years earlier. It just couldn't have. So he wrote it after the fact. That's why it's so precise. It would be easy for you. If something happened at your house yesterday and then today you're going to write an account of it, it'd be very easy for you to get all the details correct. That's what Daniel did. And it wasn't even written by Daniel, it was written by someone else with a, with a name going by Daniel. That's what they say. Why? Because they can't get above the natural. They can't get out from under the clouds of heaven to get over them, to see the supernatural that God is in charge. And if the God of the Bible is real, then he can prophesy something millions of years before. Hey, it doesn't matter. He could do it however he wants. So the first thing to know slash believe is that our God is in charge of the future. He knows the future. Brothers, sisters, our God is ruling now as he was then. You say things look chaotic. God is ruling. Things look crazy. God is ruling. Things were crazy for them. 
but God is still ruling and reigning. He is not detached, far from it. He is intimately involved. He not only orders nations and kings, as we read in our call to worship in Daniel chapter two, he orders individuals. God is the one who brought you here today. You say, no, my car brought me. No, God brought you. I wonder if you believe that. I wonder if your understanding of the God of the Bible is that he is the one that brought you here today. He is in control. You say, why did he bring me here? Because he wants you to hear hope. Because he wants you to hear a message that will give you hope in, in trying times. In the same way that he wanted to give a message of hope to the Israelites in the time of Daniel during a trying time. You and I need not despair because God is on his throne. He is still ruling and reigning. But that doesn't mean that everything will be easy, and that's our second thing to know. Number two, the future has good and bad in it. The future has good and bad in it. Remember, Daniel is in exile in Babylon. Remember, it's in the third year, verse one, it's in the third year of King Belshazzar's reign. He's still in exile in Babylon. There's no temple or sacrifice or sanctuary to offer sacrifices to God. He's not there. Remember, he has to pray three times a day toward Jerusalem because he's not in Jerusalem. And yet, in this vision, God's people are back in the land offering up the regular sacrifice. Did you notice that in verse 11? This little horn, this Antiochus epiphany comes about hundreds of years later. It acted arrogantly in verse 11, even against the prince of the heavenly army. It revoked his regular sacrifice. Listen to me. To revoke the sacrifice means that it's going on again, which means that in this vision, Daniel's paying attention for sure. He sees, oh, we're back in the land. We're back in Israel. Praise the Lord. We are actually back in the temple, the sanctuary, able to offer sacrifices. That's a great thing. But then Antiochus Epiphanes comes and it's bad all over again. The application for you and I to know is that in our future, tomorrow, next week, next month, 30 years from now, if we're still alive and the Lord has still not returned to get his people, there are going to be good things for you, but there are going to be bad things as well. If anyone told you that becoming a Christian was going to be easy and everything was just going to be pie in the sky, easy, hunky-dory, right, just amazing, they were lying to you. Or maybe they weren't just outright lying. They just didn't know what they were talking about. They thought they were telling you the truth, but they don't really know the Lord. Whether they were outright lying or, or just a little confused and came by their, their, their uh, faulty views honestly, it's not true. The life of the Christian many times gets even harder after you come to Christ because now you are spiritually alive, but you are in a spiritually dead world. And everything and everyone that is not spiritually alive is in one way or another working against you. They're not on your team. They do not like you. They do not love you. Jesus said, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. Do we believe our Bibles? If they hated me, they're going to hate you. You say, well, I'm not aware of anyone that hates me for the name of Christ. Then perhaps you don't know Christ. But that's what he said. And then Paul tells Timothy that all who want to live a godly life will face persecution. That's what Paul told Timothy. All who want to live a godly life will face persecution. Brothers and sisters, we don't know our own futures here on earth, but it is safe to say there will be some good and there will be some bad. And like Job, we are called to say the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You see, if you're, if you're a guest with us here this morning, you, you are not among a people who, who are under the impression that nothing difficult is going to happen to us. We've read our Bibles and we understand that it might even get worse for us. But we are not here worshiping God because of all of the good things that he's going to give us. We are here worshiping God because we get God. And so the Lord gives and the Lord takes away, Job says in Job 121, but blessed be the name of the Lord. It is so easy for us to worship God when the Lord gives. Amen? Oh, that's easy. You're sitting on the beach. You're on vacation. You know that a great seafood dinner is coming later, if you like seafood. And you're like, praise the Lord for his good gifts. You're excited. It's easy to praise God there. But then he takes it all away. And will you still worship him? The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The people of God worship God regardless of what God has given them or taken away from them. Because no matter what he's given to you or taken away from you, he is still with you and he is the ultimate prize. To have communion with him. We don't know the future. Now, why can't we know the future? 
Wouldn't it be nice to? We've got to be careful what we ask for. Why can't we know the future? Probably, you know, why does God not allow us to know it? Probably a ton of reasons, but one is that it would crush you and I. Our third application point of what to know, we cannot handle the knowledge we so desperately want. We cannot handle the knowledge we so desperately want. You see what all this did to Daniel in verse 27? Did you notice what it did to him? I, Daniel, was overcome and lay sick for days. I was overcome and I lay sick for days. He's laid up in the rack. He's sick as a dog. We could not bear the weight of knowing all that's coming. That's why Jesus said, don't worry about tomorrow. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. You got more than you can handle right now, don't we? We, have, we, we don't have the mental, the spiritual, the physical, any type of that power and strength to handle what's coming in the future. Not next weekend, not next decade. You and I cannot handle it. God gives us what we can handle through his power and through his spirit in the moment. Nothing more, nothing less. Now this is, this is a vision from the Lord that Daniel got. And brothers and sisters, let me, let me just as an aside encourage you to think about this, that, that God's word is going to challenge you many times. It's going gonna, it's gonna to come face to face with you. And it is not going to budge. Are you with me? So like in a sense, we are, we, <laughs> Christians are a people who have been humbled. We say, I've come face to face with the word of God, we say, and it talks about a God that is beyond me, and I'll go as far as God's good word allows me to, but then I must stop, or I'm going to get myself into trouble. I'm going to start saying things and doing things that's going to make me look like a fool. I got to stop. We are a people, as Christians, who have been humbled. If you're walking around as a Christian, bearing the name of Jesus Christ, bearing the name of membership of Standing Springs Baptist Church, and you're walking around arrogantly, you have not met Jesus. This is meant to humble us, not make us proud and arrogant. This word of God will mess with us sometimes. I worry about the people who are just like this. Never up, never down. I worry about that. You know, what's, you know what's this? This is a dead fish going downstream. A fish that is alive is moving and it's going upstream. I worry about you if you just like this. Did you never encounter anything that, that I mean, were you under the impression that this was not going to rub you the wrong way? You and I? Were we under that impression that everything I read in here, I just love it and agree with it. It's great. I, I, I read so many difficult things. What do you want me to do? What are, you, what are you supposed to do? What are we supposed to do? Just say, nah. God doesn't know what he's talking about. Daniel's confronted with the future. We are confronted many times with what is in God's word. And sometimes it can even make you sick. You say, pastor, should we talk like that? I speak with reverence. We are so man-centered in our lives and in our flesh that the word of God can make us even sick sometimes. Because we don't, I'm like, what's going on here? And, and I don't know if I agree with that and that makes me mad or angry. It's exactly what's going on with Daniel. So we must know that we gotta trust the Lord with the future. We gotta trust the Lord with the deep things of the Lord. Now two things, two points of application, two things to do as we close. Number one, lament the evil of the world. Lament the evil of the world. Verse 27, again, Daniel was overcome with all of this. I was overcome and I lay sick for days. Like Daniel, we live in dark days and the proper response should be lament, to cry out to God, how long, O Lord? How long are you gonna allow this to go on? 
How long are you going to be, allow people to be ravaged by evil and wickedness across our globe? I fear that many of us don't even understand the level of wickedness that's going on today. You know there's more slaves today than any other time in history? Today, many of them sexually exploited, nonstop. Have you faced, like have you cared to look into the evil that some of our brothers and sisters are going through across the world because of their own faith? Sometimes I come face to face with evil and wickedness and sin and I'm devastated by the destruction it causes. But then I'm also, to add insult to injury, I'm doubly discouraged because I can't do anything about it. I can't do anything. My hands are tied. There's nothing I can do but just watch it or just know that it's happening. When is the last time that we wept because of the devastation of sin, either in your own life or in the life of others or in the world around you? Do you long for heaven with Christ? Do you long to be with your Savior? Or are you quite all right as things are? Daniel laments the evil of the world. We are called to lament the evil of the world. But number two, second thing that he does as far as application and what to do, he gets back to work. Verse 27, I, Daniel, was overcome and lay sick for days. Then I got up and I went about the king's business. Then I got up and I went about the king's business. Daniel was sick as a dog. He was overcome with worry and who knows what else. He cried and he wept until he had run out of tears. And then he wipes his eyes. And he goes back to work on Monday morning. Working for a pagan king. And a government that is oppressing him. Exiled away from his homeland. I got up and I went about the king's business. In our work, we have work to do. As the people of God, living in a dark time, in a dark world. And our work is not to live a life of ease. Our work is not to pad our 401ks. Our work is not just to improve this world. Our work is to declare and to display the gospel so that God might have more worshipers. I wonder if you believe it with me. I think some of you say that you believe it, but you don't really believe it or you don't really care. Do you think that God deserves more worshipers in Simpsonville, South Carolina? More. There's not enough. That's why we stand here. That's why I stand here week in and week out and I stand up and I proclaim the gospel so that people might hear it. Faith comes by hearing. Romans 10. And hearing by the very word of God, the word of Christ. We stand up and we proclaim it as a church. And then we're scattered out in the community to go declare it and to proclaim it some more. I wonder, do you even care that God doesn't have more worshipers here? God showed up to Paul in the book of Acts. Paul's in Corinth facing a lot of trouble, a lot of difficulty, because gospel ministry is hard and difficult, and people come after you. God comes to him a vision. He says, I want you to stay there, because I've got many people in this city. He wasn't talking about the people who already been saved. No, no, no. I've got many people in this city that have yet to believe. You stay and you proclaim. And that's our job. You and I have work to do. You and I can lament sin in the world. We must do it. There are psalms of lament. Psalms of lament, like the whole point of the psalm is be sad about sin. (laughs) May it grieve you. But then we are called to get back up and go out and work. Because we have all the answers? No. Daniel didn't. He said, I couldn't understand it. Did you see there in verse 27? I was greatly disturbed by the vision. I couldn't understand it. So he didn't get up and go back to the king's work because God said, sit down, Daniel. I'm going to explain every single detail from now to kingdom come. 
And then you can get back to work once you're satisfied. No, 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 no. He said, I don't, I don't understand this. But he got back to work. Because we don't have questions? Oh, I got plenty of questions. Don't you have questions? We got questions, but we don't get up and get back to work because all of our questions have been answered. No, we're disturbed sometimes by what we see. We're even at times disturbed by things that we read in our Bibles. But we get up and we go back to work. Why? Because that's our mandate from our king. As you are going, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them all to obey all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you to the end of the age. Don't read over that last part. Behold, I am with you to the end of the age. Why can you do that? Why can you make disciples and teach them and baptize them? Why can you do that? Because Jesus Christ is with you to the end of the age. Like Daniel, our future will be full of blessings from God, but also difficulties. We will lament the evil, but then we will get up and do what the Lord has called us to do. What has he called you to do? What has he called you to do? He has not called you to ride out into the sunset. Is it mission work? Is he calling you to mission work? Is it full-time ministry? Does he want you to lay aside your job and, and to work vocationally in a church? Is it something as small as, hey, I come on Sunday morning, but the Lord has called me to come back on Sunday nights to pray with God's people that he might do a great work in our midst? Is it to be more generous with the resources that the Lord has given you so that we might see more gospel expansion, more kingdom work, not just in our own community, but in others? What is God calling you to do? What we're called to do is to get up and to be about our Father's business. Let us pray. Father, there are two types of people here this morning. There's two types of people in the whole world. Your word makes that very clear. We are either gathering or we are scattering. We are either sheep or we are goats. We are either in the kingdom of God or outside the kingdom of God. We are either children of God or we are children of the enemy. And those two groups are always represented when the, when the word is proclaimed. And we don't know who is who. I don't know. The people here don't know. We have pretty good ideas because Jesus, in your word, God said that you will know them by their fruits, but ultimately only you know God. Only you can see into the heart. You alone know who is inside the kingdom this morning and who is outside the kingdom today. For those who are inside the kingdom, I pray that you would build them up through the preaching of your word. That these points of application, they would take and implement in their lives. You would give them strength through your Holy Spirit to obey what you've commanded them to do. For those who are here this morning outside of your kingdom, God, you are freely offering your grace to them. Show them their need of a Savior and that Jesus Christ is his name. May they call upon you, upon the name of Jesus, and be saved. It's in the name of Jesus we pray, amen. If you're in that second group outside the kingdom of God, we would love to talk with you about that. Would love to show you how you can become a Christian. You're welcome to come talk with me at the end of the service about that if you'd like. Let's stand and respond to the gospel.